the evening Roaring Twenties dinner and entertainment was a great way to celebrate our 100, 100 years of service. Today will be different. With it, we have two wonderful speakers. So let's begin. Margaret Schwab, please introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Madam President. Barb Dowding needs very little in way of introduction to this group. She is a true British Columbian born and raised in Vancouver. She joined the League in 1978 and her pa passion blossomed. Through that passion, she has served the League in many, many positions and leadership roles in, on every different level. Of course, we all remember her as National President of the Catholic Women's League of Canada from 2014 to 2016. Barb's belief has always been that parish councils are the heart of the League. Barb has recently retired as Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Vancouver, but continues to serve as a consultant to the Archbishop as well as maintaining her membership on a number of committees. She has recently been appointed to the CCCB, newly formed Indigenous Reconcili Reconciliation Fund Board, which will oversee the administration of funds for approved projects over the next five years. She is also part of the CCCB National Synthesis Team that went to Rome last October for the opening of the Synod and which prepared the report for Canada that has been sent to Rome. As you can imagine, Barb does not have a lot of spare time, but she greatly enjoys a game of golf, I hear, holidays with her husband, Alan, and time with her three sons and their families. And of course, time with her six grandchildren is the highlight of her retirement. Please welcome Honorary Life Member Barb Dowding. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, lovely. It always feels so weird when someone's talking about you, so thanks very much for that. So today, we're gonna try to do something a bit serious and hopefully a bit fun and hopefully have a chance to, you know, spread out, meet some new people and uh, we'll see where this goes. So to start off, we're gonna do a little icebreaker and everybody's going, oh, Eight icebreakers. <laughs> How many did that? Don't worry, it's very simple. So the, we're going to do table work, just for a short time. The person whose birthday is closest to today will be the person to go first. So, wait a minute, wait a minute. So in true synod fashion, so we're in synod mode now, we're in a circle of people, we're going to have a chance to speak once as you go around the table so everyone has a chance to have a sentence or two. This is not, it's not a big, long thing. But this is what I want to know. <clears throat> what I want you to do. I want you to state your name, where you're from, and how long you've been a League member. Okay? Not too hard. Then share one reason at your table that you feel particularly blessed. And I already know the answer for some of you. Anyway, so that's the deal. Okay, so the person whose birthday is closest to today Quickly figure that out. Start off by sharing your name, where you're from, and what you're particularly feeling blessed for. Can you hear me back there? I don't think so. Do you think? What? Oh, they've started. Oh, you've started. OK, go. So I just wanted you to think about if you remembered all the names of the people, especially at the tables where you didn't know everyone before, and if anything extraordinary struck you as you listened to the blessings. Was your heart full? Were you impressed? Were you happy? Are we blessed or what? Okay. So this is a good exercise. Yes, thank you. Clap, clap. This is a really good exercise on listening and how hard it is to concentrate only on the person speaking. Our recent experiences of synodality demonstrates that freedom and openness that comes from the circles of conversation, especially in the times of listening. More on that later. So 
So today, we want to explore what it takes and how to intentionally walk with another. It's easy to be a friend to someone you like or have things in common with. But what about when someone you barely know, someone who maybe irritates you, yeah, someone maybe who doesn't even like you. The league is like family. It can be messy, disagreements are common, and sen sometimes serious fall, serious fall out occurs. But like in the family, love will prevail. The art of, uh, the art of accompaniment, as envisioned by Pope Francis, is more intentional and often outside our comfort zone but it also has its beginning in common ground. The words of Pope Francis can be taken to heart to help us focus. He says this, to abandon the complacent attitude that says, we've always done it this way. <laughs> That's what he said. And instead, he invites us to be bold and creative in this task of rethinking goals cultural change, uh, sorry, rethinking goals, structures, styles, and methods. To understand that today's vast and rapid cultural changes demand that we constantly seek new ways. When the national executive took the leap of faith with great courage and conviction to undertake a plan, a process I should say, to plan strategically, it was a clear response to the sign of the times on many fronts but mostly within our league. The changes in our league, membership, participation, and engagement mirror what's going on in our churches. Joy of the gospel and the league. Pope Francis pulls no punches when he says, Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you. And now he is living at your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. And nothing is more solid, profound, secure, meaningful, and wisdom-filled than that initial proclamation. Listen again. Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you. And now he is living at your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. By being authentic witnesses who continue to pray for guidance and wisdom, the League will surely set the world ablaze once again with love and zeal. Let our efforts be marked by, by joy, encouragement, liveliness, and a harmonious balance as per Pope Francis. The CWL is connected to the past with eyes on the future. This guiding principle is a beacon for our members. In the desire to grow the league, to give it life and meaning, let's go back to basics. Throughout the process of planning strategically, one constant has been the importance of being a faith-based organization. It is the Catholicity and desire to grow spiritually that makes the league different from other women's groups. As Catholic women, embracing the baptismal call to bring others to Jesus, members strive to be approachable, non-judgmental, open to dialogue, offering patience, warmth, and welcome. The words of Pope Francis can be taken to heart and to help focus. Oh, I think I already said that about abandoning that. Um, we've always done it that way. I just wanted to pause for a moment and ask you to think about how how comforting that is. Who better to accompany us than Jesus himself? Are we truly open and ready to accept this accompaniment? Think about it. Okay. We also need to meet people where they are at. I think that's poor grammar, but that's what we're trying to say. Those who are wounded with both visible and invisible wounds need to be attended to. They need to have the wounds bound, as the Pope, 
Hope uses the picture of a field hospital where people who are in a field hospital need immediate attention to what is hurting them the most. Before we can walk or talk with those who are hurting, we need to find ways to address their current situation. I love how Pope Francis sees the needs of those on the margins and encourages us always to find ways to go there. So in this vein, we need to learn the art of accompaniment, which teaches us, quote, to remove our sandals before the sacred ground of another. The pace of this accompaniment must be steady and reassuring, reflecting our closeness and compassionate gaze which also heals, liberates, and encourages growth. Genuine spiritual accompaniment always begins and flourishes in the context of service. Our personal experience of being accompanied and assisted and of openness to those who accompany us will teach us to be patient and compassionate with others and to find the right way to gain their trust, their openness, and their readiness to grow. Our mission as Catholic women then is to help our parishes be places of holiness, that through the efforts of the Catholic Women's League, the parish may be a place of welcome, a sanctuary where the thirsty come to drink in the midst of their journey, a place for hearing God's word, for dialogue, proclamation, charitable outreach, worship, and celebration. Our mission is to build up the community of communities to help breathe new life into our parishes by being the best we can be. We are to be welcoming and inclusive. The Holy Father, in guiding the Synodal Church, gave clear direction. This journey, he says, is both gift and task. By journeying together and reflecting on the journey that has been made, we, the church, will be able to learn through ex her experience how we can help her live in communion, to achieve participation, and to open herself to mission. We are reminded again and often how critical listening is to the synodal process. Open minds and hearts without prejudice. And how do we prepare for this difficult mission? We need to recover a contemplative spirit which can help us realize ever anew that we have been entrusted with a treasure which makes us more human and leads us to, to new life. Pope Francis tells us that Eucharistic adoration brings us closer to the Lord. For when we renew our personal experience of Christ's friendship, we are most able to respond to others. We have the treasure of life and love that cannot deceive and a message which cannot mislead or disappoint. It is critical at this point in our history that we are aware of the current cultural culture that is choosing anonymity, how do you say anonymity? being anonymous, <laughs> silence, and death, sorry. By spending time in prayer and adoration, we open ourselves to hear God's voice. We are refreshed and nourished. We go forth from that sacred space, ready to tackle anything the Lord offers us. And I just remembered here on slide eight that on slide two, I wanted to say, Let's ask the Holy Spirit to join us in case he hasn't already. But I wanted to remind everyone that this is a whole exercise in listening, being inspired, and that the Holy Spirit is here with us, but we need to be open and free so that um, the work that the Spirit is going to do within us and for us and by us will happen. So there's my prayer halfway through. We are reminded of the early church where no one was in need and day by day the Lord added to their numbers. And why was no one in need? Because they were filled with joy, unflagging courage and zeal in proclaiming the gospel. 
quote, let everyone admire how you care for one another and how you encourage and accompany one another. This is how I see our great league, known for its love and care of members and non-members alike. Where we see service with smiles and love, we see the league as the early disciples. People see us and want to have what we have and want to share what we have. Pope Francis reminds us quite graphically, we are all in the same boat and headed to the same port. Let us ask for the grace to rejoice in the gifts of each which belong to all. So how do we welcome, include, and reach those who only know of a detached God and bring the message to Jesus to them personally? Can you think of a time when you did not respond to someone who needed help? How often do we look the other way when we're not sure what to do or what to say? As Catholics, we must respond, always looking outward like those first disciples. A church, or CWL council, turned in on itself will not flourish. The CWL is well placed to be that source of inclusion and welcome. How well do we do this? Think about your own council. Think about the member who comes to your meeting for the first time. What do they think? Do we welcome them? Do we notice them? Sometimes we do. Or we just have coffee with our friends because it's comfortable. I think it's a huge thing to think about, and that is when new people come into the parish or into the CWL Council to make sure that they feel that you're happy that they're there, and not just because they're a number and paying their dues, right? But I think I can, in my own experience, see how that has happened um, in my council, and I'm sure, I hope not too many in yours, but it's something to think about. We have to be the beacon, the beacon of welcome. So how will we achieve this? Pope Francis quote on the purpose of the synod that we can adopt for ourselves. Oops. This is a really long quote, but I'm gonna give it all to you. It's um, beautiful. I'll do it slowly. He says, the synod is not to make more work or produce more documents. It is, quote, to plant dreams, draw forth prophecies and vision, allow hope to flourish, inspire trust, bind up wounds, to get work together for relationships, awaken a dawn of hope, learn from one another, and create a bright new resourcefulness that will enlighten minds, warm hearts, and give strength to our hands. Does that sound like us, what we want to be like? That's the vision for the Synod, and that's who we are part of that. You should look that one up, it's really good. The decree of the laity reminds us in no uncertain terms of our call to help the suffering, however or wherever we find them. We are to seek them out, find them, console them with great solitude, and help them with appropriate relief. But what does it mean to console with great solitude? Solicitude, sorry, not solitude, solicitude. It means taking a personal interest, engaging in a conversation, listening without judging. Our faith drives us to love our neighbor, justice impels us to action. No one ever deserves to be or feel neglected, and no one should journey alone. The more we are exposed to the suffering of those around us, the more profound is our compassion, and compassion leads to action. Basic charity, basic justice, human dignity restored. I have two little examples I want you to think about, and I think that I will sort of divide the room in half. So that, this will be number one, and from this table here to the end, about that, number two. There are two scenarios that I'd, I'd like you to discuss at your table, okay? So the first one is about Clara. So that'll be for you. Clara is living in substandard accommodation 
struggles to put food on the table for her children, is dealing with drug addictions and has a partner who is in and out of jail. She's terrified of losing her children, afraid for the future, and barely hanging on to each and every day. She cannot pray because she has lost hope. That is, until she met Mary, a volunteer who befriended her. Now Clara has not only someone to talk to, she has something to work toward for herself and her future. More than money or food, Clara needed someone to listen to her, to believe her, and not judge. Mary knows by walking with Clara on her difficult journey, conditions will improve and spiritual healing is possible. Clara had a poverty of spirit that is not that of the Beatitudes, but rather a spirit broken by what life has thrown her. And Mary knows a trusting relationship is a start out of the depths. So I want you to talk about Clara in a minute, but I'll tell the other story so you guys can talk too. Don't talk yet. Okay, don't talk yet. <laughs> it's not hard to find a wom women who are hungry or living in abject poverty. Their circumstances are pretty obvious. But what about those other women in our midst who suffer from a broken spirit or experience spiritual desolation and we don't even know it? Too often they are our friends, sisters, neighbors, or store clerks. They live among us and with us. They go to our church, like Elsie. Elsie is quiet, well-groomed, smiles at you when you talk to her, but rarely starts a conversation. She has been in the parish CWL forever. No one knows she is a victim of elder abuse because no one has taken the time to get to know. She is terrified and ashamed because everyone knows her family. In fact, she recently stopped going to the CWL meeting because the topic of abuse became too much for her. Elsie goes to Mass and prays, but she doesn't believe that God will help her. Even if one of our CWL sisters had heard her silent call, Elsie could have had a chance. So just talk about those examples um, for a few minutes in your circles. Um, of experiences that you've had where maybe you found Elsie and was able to help her, or what we can do to make sure that we're more um, in touch with the people who are right beside us. Okay, does that clear enough? You got an idea what I'm saying? Yeah? Okay. You can go. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So the CWL is the natural relationship builder. Known for its sisterhood, the CWL embodies what it means to journey with another person. Think for a moment about all the relationships in your league life. Stories of carpooling for hours to get to conventions or meetings, taking turns to drive, leading the rosary, singing, all those crazy songs you could think of. The talk and the sharing of the good and the not so good in a safe place with sisters who cared and listened. Hilarious stories abound of escapades around packing four or five bodies in a hotel room at convention and how that all unfolded. We could probably write a book about some of those things, but I wouldn't dare. <laughs> For me, over the years, I have, sorry. The first time I came face to face with a life member was when I was a member, just a member, and she was provincial president. And I had to take something to her to sign for whatever, I can't remember, and it was about nine o'clock at night. So I went over, knocked on the door, and she opened it, this lady who is professional, epitome of grace and beauty, with her curlers and her house coat and a room full of people dressed kind of the same, getting halfways ready for bed. But the thing I remember the most was the welcome to come into an already packed room with people I never didn't know. They were, they were like on the executive level, you know those people that are way up there that you kind of feel like you're way down here? But the feeling that they made me feel like I was important to be there and it was really welcome. I think I, I never would, never would, I, ugh, I never will forget that. They were so welcoming. They said, come in, and so I did. There was standing room only, but it's the invitation to enter. I'll never forget that warmth of welcome. There's so many personal stories that need to be told. 
Over the years, I've had my share of roommates and learned firsthand the importance of our common bond. It was the intimacy that comes from really knowing another person. Talking late into the night, stories told, pain explored, joy shared. I was not used to sharing when I first got into the league. And if time allowed, I could tell you some funny stories about the many years Pat Battensby and Ann Doby and I were roommates. We were diocesan presidents in Vancouver, one after the other. So for many years, we shared 333. Whoever was the diocesan president of the day got coffee in bed. That was the thing. <laughs> and the newest one had to make the coffee. But it worked like a charm. It worked like a charm. It was during these years that Pat and Anne carried me through, accepting my feelings of fear and inadequacy with love and kindness. They taught me, most importantly, to laugh at myself and trust my instincts. Together, we three weathered many a storm, cried buckets of tears, but we relished each other's accomplishments and always had each other's back. Our bond was, not, it was likely not unique. I'm sure you can recognize yourself in this. Some of the league journeys we hear about are so powerful, and there's so many. So when I was preparing for this talk, I thought, I'm going to see if some of our honorary life members want to share something. Well, some did and some didn't, and that's perfectly fine. But I have a selection for you today of some experiences of their um, being accompanied or accompanying someone else. So the first person I'm going to introduce you to is Jean Mahoney, Mahoney Jacqueline. Jacqueline Auger, whose mother is a life member, is going to read what Jean's daughter, Maureen, wrote for her. Maureen wrote what she wrote with, um, with Jean's permission. Thank you, Jackie. So I'm speaking as Maureen, who is Jean's daughter. Humility was paramount with our mom and continues to be. My three brothers and I grew to know the passion that Mum had for the League. She made so many friendships and had gained a profound strength from her work with the League that to this day continues to give her strength. Velma Harrison, an honorary life member, continues to visit Mum and no doubt is a highlight. Velma brings Mum the latest news and keeps mom up on the good work that continues. I remember the sudden passing of my father and one of the first visits mom received the next day was from Velma, a calming, familiar presence from a league member. Not a month later, her brother-in-law, the late Bishop James Mahoney died. After the deaths of my dad and uncle, Mum was once again strengthened by the many cards and condolences from League members. My uncle told me once that Mum had started out with the CWL by making sandwiches in the basement of St. Paul's Cathedral in Saskatoon. I also marveled after many years and after her presidency that she went back to her beginnings and was serving sandwiches and serving at funerals, again at her home parish of St. Anne's. This brought her meaning and pleasure. She was saddened by the possible closure of her own council, but encouraged others to get involved and always welcomed new members. The council continues on to this day. I attended many meetings before my schooling started. Some attended preschool, but I attended CWL meetings. <laughs> My three brothers and I always wondered and thought maybe it was that she was getting away from us for a break as she was always so excited and happy to attend conventions, whether diocesan, provincial, and then national. She would leave us with our dad and would tell us that we would be fine. It wasn't until years later that we understood the importance of this to our mom and that she considered it a blessing to belong to a strong group of women and the good work that they did. Mom told me that a little of time given is precious and it would yield amazing results. 
it was good for anyone and everyone to share their wisdom and experience. She taught me that each person has a special role and unique gifts. She told us to share our gifts and seize the moment. She said that small actions would yield unbelievable results. Mum was national president from 1982 to 1984. During her time as president, she encouraged CWL members to write letters of support to the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo, a human rights group in Argentina who was searching for their missing grandchildren during the military dictatorship. Mum traveled to Argentina as a member observer of the Joint Canadian Catholic Organization for Development and Peace. She met with local women and offered moral support. She had asked CWL members of 1,600 parish councils to write letters to political parties in Argentina, asking they pressure the government to search for the children. Mum said this gave the mothers hope and as she often taught my brothers and me, that hope is profound. She stated that if the government knew that the eyes of the world were on them, they might rule differently as there was an election that year. Some of the children were found when mom was there. Many of the missing children were those of educated parents. Their abduction was the government's way to frighten other parents so to silence criticism of the country's leadership. She was quoted in a newspaper article in 1983. The CWL's involvement with the grandmothers of Argentina has had some positive results and that, and that the organization was partly kept alive by the pressure put on the government by the CWL. She had met with several of the country's human rights leaders, but found the most moving experience of the trip was a dinner with a family that had lost three of their four children. Before she left, the family asked her to have her picture taken with the pictures of the missing children. The parents said they knew the children would have appreciated a visit from a Canadian. Mum said she felt their suffering but that they always had hope, and she knew they appreciated the letters from the CWL. Mum said the smallest gesture can yield results. We think she was pleased to see the four of us when she got home. Mum continues on this next journey of her life with continued grace and a deep faith. We, as her children, continue to learn from Mum as this is a difficult leg of the journey for us, but she has great strength from an enriched life of family, friends, and you, the members of the CWL, that she learnt and gained so much from. Mum taught us not to wonder why. The staff in the facility she now resides at seems to think she is there, she is helping others there with her kindness still. One of the reasons I wanted to share that, all of it, was because I don't know how many people knew about that time that the CWL was involved in that, um, the, the ch missing children in Argentina. So a bit of education too. Uh, I could ask uh, Velma and Betty Ann to get ready, but almost. So, Vivian Bosch was president from 2000 to 2002. Her theme was the open door. Vivian sent this. Sisterhood is about investing our time in others, building relationships, and empowering one another to be who we are meant to be. At a 1990, in 1990, at the CWL National Convention held in Montreal, I met the photographer Eleanor Arliss, many of you know Eleanor, who continues to bring fresh air into my life Myrna Murray from PEI Never Wavers. I have been truly blessed with many wonderful sisters in the CWL over the years. And now I'd like to ask Velma to come forward. Velma was president from 2010, 2012, and her theme was centered on faith and justice. Thanks, Velma. 
Thank you. My four-year term as Canada's representative on the board of the World Union of Catholic Women's Organizations and regional vice president of North America provided an incredible experience of journeying, accompanying, and developing relationships with women from around the world. It began in Fatima and concluded at the General Assembly in Dakar, Senegal, an experience that has impacted my life. Several trips to Rome for board meetings included a meeting with the Pontifical Council for the Family, the Pontifical Council for the Laity, a meeting with Cardinal Turkson, and I remember meeting with him, and the phone rang, and he said, excuse me, it's the boss. <laughs> as well as we had a public audience with the Pope. We met with the women of the Middle East in Bari, Italy, where I learned firsthand their daily struggles, and we shared many stories. Previous trips to the Holy Land also confirmed to me the plight of the Christians there. And as a result, Velma's dream materialized in cooperation with Catholic Near East Welfare Association and it remains a permanent voluntary fund of the Catholic Women's League of Canada to this day. The women that I served with on the Wokwo board were truly amazing and taught me much about their customs, their culture, their traditions, but mostly about their deep faith in difficult times. There was Margaret from Ghana. She was the first lady I met when I arrived at my first board meeting and she welcomed me and told me where I could go to buy drinking bottled water. Now that might not sound very important, but to me it was, because we had to buy our bottled water. There was Bernadette from Malawi, who was my roommate, and I learned much from her. There was Jennifer from South Africa, Mary from Zambia, Catherine from Australia, Adelma from Cuba, Virginia from Venezuela, and dear Helen from South Korea, who was a very timid and always felt more secure when she was with me, and I was so happy to be with her. Rosaline from Cameroon and I spent an afternoon together after our meeting, shopping in Rome. And if you ever have the opportunity to shop with an African lady, it's truly a wonderful experience. <laughs> She bought hundreds of rosaries to take back home. These were a group of wonderful women who became friends. Will I ever see them again? Not likely. But I'm grateful to have known them. They have impacted my life, and I believe that sharing my life had a similar effect on them. I also had the opportunity to serve with Maria Lea Zervino, who was the Secretary General of WOKO when I was on the board. She is now the President General and recently appointed by Pope Francis to the Castry for Bishops. I left my time on the board of Oko with a great sense of gratitude for the opportunity to journey with so many wonderful people and to be so enriched by serving on the world stage. My closing thought, however, is that we frequently encounter people in our own local communities on a daily basis who affect how we think, how we react, and in turn, our behavior will affect others as well. As we journey through life, we are all on the same road together as God's children. And as Pope Francis says, in the same boat, heading to the same port. Thank you, Dama. Thank you. Thanks, Velma. And now, Betty Ann Brown Davidson, president from 2012 2014. And her theme was We Have Seen the Lord. Don't walk in front of me, I may not follow. Don't walk behind me, I may not lead. Just walk beside me and be my friend. This is beside my door that I go in and out of the house all the time. In 1995, Honorary Life members Claire Heron and Joan Chesser participated in the United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing. 
Some controversy erupted upon their return. Not all gender issues are sanctioned or supported by the Catholic Church. Combating violence against women was of paramount importance. To highlight this scourge, a March for Women was organized for September 2000 in Ottawa. Sheila Pellerin of Nova Scotia was our national CWL president at the time. Understanding our work with and resolutions in support of this important topic, the Canadian bishops asked us to be a presence at that march. Well, all hell broke loose, <laughs> especially among the pro-life forces that declared that this was a march in support of abortion. Many bishops, priests, and league members disagreed with our participation in the march, and they let their voices be heard beforehand. At the time, I was president of the Ontario CWL Council. In June of 2000, one of my beautiful daughters took her own life. Only afterwards did I discover that she had been a victim of violence and abuse when she was a child. A month later, I was to chair my first provincial con convention, and it took place in London Diocese. At the last moment, our provincial spiritual advisor, a bishop, begged off due to a sore back. Father Randy from Peterborough Diocese offered to stand beside us as spiritual advisor. Father Randy was a big man. All was well. He had his feet on the ground. The national representative to our provincial convention was Bishop Crosby, national spiritual advisor at the time, rather than our national president. During the business sessions, there were several out of order interruptions, but Bishop Crosby stood by my side and gave me strength. Several CWL councils threatened to quit. We allowed them to determine their own path. We were determined to fulfill the, C the CCCB's request and to attend the March for Women in September. Life members, Moira St. Marie and Joan Hasty, who at the time was on the National Executive, drove to Ottawa with me. We quietly took our places in the second pew at the Basilica, where Bishop Gervais was going to say a mass before we embarked on the march to Parliament Hill. Ahead of us in the church sat the head of the Knights of Columbus for Ontario and other dignitaries. Before Mass began, an altar server came down to our pew and inquired if we were the delegation from the CWL. Yes, we smiled. He said, Archbishop Gervais wanted us to follow him. And we were taken up to sit up on the altar, on the main altar, on chairs, to face the whole congregation. Moira, Joan, and I took strength from this assurance by the Archbishop. After Mass, the whole congregation joined the march of over 50,000 people along Sussex Drive to Parliament Hill. This was before the days of protest marches. This may have been one of the first to take place. Anyway, we had no idea what to expect. We walked quietly. We prayed for the thousands of women who had suffered at the hands of cruel people. We kept our heads down, all the while looking if that other group was trying to take over the initial reasons for this march. There were groups in support of disabled women, of immigrant workers, of nannies and street women, so many people begging for justice and goodwill. Toward the end of the march, we did notice four very loud, obnoxious groups that looked like hired students who vehemently were proclaiming in support of abortion rights and the Planned Parenthood agenda. But they were a very small minority. We saw that with our own eyes on the whole lawn in front of Parliament buildings. We were not there to support their issues. So with regards to accompaniment, walking with, I could not, I, I'm a chicken. I could not have done that 
Without the support of the CCCB, without Father Randy, without Bishop Crosby, without the support of our League Sisters on our Provincial Council, without the efforts of our dear National President Sheila Pellerin, and without the prayers of so many League members. I am forever grateful to Joan Hasty and Moira St. Marie, Ontario Life members, now deceased, who taught me the tenacity, courage, public speaking and leadership skills that changed my life. Just walk beside me and be my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Betty Ann. League Sisters have so many stories and testimonies that inspire us to reach out more and more authentically. Take a few minutes to share at your table ways your relationships that started in, ways your league relationships started and what made them grow. Can you think of one thing in particular? What makes that one special? How did it start? Who has sustained you in your league journey and how did they do it? Okay, Madam President says I can have five minutes here, so we're gonna take the five minutes and go for it, okay? If I could bring you back, and that exercise or that discussion really raised the level of noise in the room, so, so I encourage you to pick it up with them. If you met someone new at the table over lunch or when you see them after, I was just saying to Fran, this, you know, workshops like this is like preaching to the converted, right? But you're converted, but are you doing anything about it? So the whole idea is to remind us, remind ourselves of what we're called to do. So the message isn't new, but hopefully the going forward will be new and vibrant. So next I just have a little message from uh, Marie Cameron, who um, has allowed me to read this for, you, for her. She says, I have been accompanied by many wonderful women, League Sisters mainly, over the years, and it's rather difficult to choose one specifically. True enough. All have become League Sisters and good friends. I found that most of them shared my vision that if it's to be, it's up to me. Together we discovered that to move the League's social justice actions and spirituality, spirituality Beyond just an idea, it's up to each active and interested member to become personally involved by sharing our talents and praying for each other. I have been blessed by a deeper spiritual insight and life as well as becoming more aware of the social justice issues, not only in Canada, but also in the world. And Marie, I just want to say, I remember when you were national president and you talked a lot about the small Christian communities, remember? And we talked about, we tried to get them going bit by bit. In the Pope's um, Joy of the Gospel, there's a whole section about small communities. And in the national synthesis going to Rome, there is a section there that the Canadian church is looking to having more small Christian communities. So that's for you. Could I please ask um, Sandra McConnell to come forward and Morgan Ann to be ready? Sandra is going to um, read something that Irene Lafort sent. And this was, uh, Irene was president in 1986 to 88. And her theme was stewardship in church renewal. Thank you, Sandra. In response to your request for an experience of accompaniment in the league, I can say that I have had many instances of this in my 69 years of membership. However, there is one occasion that really stands out in my memory and was certainly a deciding factor in my years of commitment to this great organization. In 1972, I was diocesan president of the Antigonish Diocesan Council. We hosted a national convention in Sydney. Dorothy Brocklehurst and I were co-chairs of the hosting committee. Dorothy had attended one national convention, and I had never attended any. For me, this is the first convention was the experience of a lifetime. When I was privileged to meet some powerful woman, women who were part of the national executive, 
and all of whom had been or would later become national presidents. They were Iphigeni Arsenault, Florence Fabris, Molly Boucher, Mary Matthews, and Betty Aiken. Those women awed and inspired me as a young woman with their knowledge, expertise, and dedication to the Catholic Women's League, and as good friends do, they accompanied me as a young woman with their, sorry, they accompanied me along the way. Conveners were not elected at that time, but were appointed by the national president. And some of these women appointed me to various convenerships on the national level and were always there to help, encourage, and mentor me in my league journey. Throughout the years, I have endeavored to accompany other members, young women coming up through the ranks, both at the national and parish and diocesan levels. The sisterhood of our league members is one of the greatest assets of this organization rooted in faith and service to God in Canada. I take great pride in being a long-standing member, member of this wonderful organization and proud to be Catholic and living it. Now I'd like to introduce Margaret Ann Jacob, but I just need an introduction. I was raised in the country. I was very shy, introverted, and I was definitely lacking in self-confidence. Among many others and many others, Moira St. Marie, then diocesan president, but later friend, sister, mother, and mentor, she significantly impacted my league life and indeed my whole life. I did not allow my name to stand for election at diocesan level, believing that I did not have the qualities required for this commitment and likely, most likely, without the courage to drive in Toronto. No small undertaking for a country girl. Moira encouraged me to step forward. She appointed me as the Education and Health Standing Committee Chairperson. Indeed, after the first public speaking contest that I hosted, she, we went back to her house and she wanted a picture with her as the current diocesan president, with Betty Ann Brown Davidson, who was the past diocesan president, and with me, who she said would become the next president of the diocese. Uh, I, I couldn't even imagine it. I think six or seven years later, I was diocesan president. I learned so much from Moira. She was a woman of deep faith, totally committed to her family. She had a delightful sense of humor, and she knew how to brighten any situation with her wit and her wisdom. She knew how to stir the pot, so to speak. She could plant seeds of hope and inspiration, and she could lead a group through a maze of indecision while convincing them that the outcome was their idea in the first place. <laughs> I think it was her political working the crowd, so to speak. And last night I kept thinking, she'd be out here in costume. She was a master at, char at chairing a meeting. She kept the discussion on track, affirming the input of her coworkers and always, always with a sense of respect and levity. She always made time for everyone and welcomed all into her life and into her home. Later, as I moved along my CWL journey, she was always there to listen, to encourage, and to advise. Toronto seemed to have a plethora of meetings. Moira insisted that as executive members, we attended these meetings to be with the members and not to sit in an isolated cluster at the back of the room. I've carried this teaching of hers with me throughout my league journey. There's so much to learn from the members one-on-one, -on -one, whether it was sitting at tables, 
setting up tables in White Horse at their convention, set them up for the resolution session. Those girls had so few people to work. It was a delight to work with them doing that. Ironing flags in PEI for the, before the convention started. I, I worked with the girls in the kitchen in Nova Scotia. Most of these people didn't know who I was, which was okay. I, I was a member. I was there to be with them. So it was a real education for me. And when I attended the provincial convention in Quebec at a retreat house, I came down for breakfast a little late one morning and uh, all the others in the group had started. I spied a woman sitting all by herself and I, I asked her if I could join her. She welcomed me, but she said uh, she was not with that other group. <laughs> and I said, well, that was okay. I said, that's all right, no matter. And uh, I have no idea how this woman ended up at that retreat house that weekend. I will never forget her story. She was a divorced woman with children who had ostracized her whose family had abandoned her, and she just seemed to have absolutely no hope. I remember her tell, telling her that that, you know, that other group were the Catholic Women's League, and they would really welcome her. And the meeting room was, it was interesting, it was set up, uh, you know, the podium every the front, but then all the members, and then there was like a, a wall across, you know, and movable walls. And at the back, there were things set up, but people could walk in there and have coffee and sit in. And so I said, I encouraged her to sit at the back of our gathering room. And I said, listen, listen to the program. Check out the displays. These were women that, who I knew could provide the kind of support that she needed. I did, I did see her talking to some of the girls. Suzanne, I think, was one of them. And I think Janet McLean, if I'm not mistaken, but I know Suzanne, I can remember seeing Suzanne over there showing her some stuff. Um, I was shocked beyond belief when on the Sunday afternoon at the closing mass, she went up to communion. I was sitting beside Janet McLean. I grabbed her arm. I think Janet thought I was having a seizure. And I said, <laughs> oh, I, I can't believe. I was so profoundly affected at seeing her come and join and be there. I, I truly believe there was a miracle happened that weekend. But without Moira planting those seeds, nurturing them, and celebrating their harvest, my CWL journey would not have been so rewarding. She walks with me still. She is my friend, my sister, my mother, my mentor, and may she rest in peace. Could I, could I ask uh, Roxanne and Lorette, uh, uh, Alice to come up, please? We have two, two more little testimonies and then we'll wrap up. <clears throat> right, Madam President? Yes. <laughs> So Lorette Noble can't be with us today, but her daughter is here, provincial president, and newly minted life member. So she's going to say a few words from Lorette. Thank you. Barbara asked me to read this in my mother's voice. So if it was in the evening, I would have had a lot of drinks and my English accent would have come out. But I ask you to just think of this being said with a lovely English accent for those of you who know my mother. And so she wrote to Barb, Dear Barb, here are a few words. I used to hear and see what the Catholic Women's League was doing a while ago. I forget how many years now. In spite of what some of my friends think, I have been, or rather, I used to be, very shy about getting up and speaking at any convention. And then I was voted into office and there seemed to be no way out of doing my duty. <laughs> Everyone has always been so kind and it was a pleasure to report on all the good things our small council was doing in our parish and diocese. I never dreamt where joining the league would take me 
And I have to admit that I enjoyed every single minute of every meeting and every convention. And I'm so delighted that our daughter, Alice, is now having the same experience. <laughs> I'm so sad not to be there with you and her and all my wonderful friends. Kim said she would arrange to have me here and see Alice when she gives her report. So I'm looking forward to that, as you can imagine. However, please give my love to all my wonderful CWL pals. And please tell them I pray for them every night. And also you, by name. Have a wonderful convention. And may God continue to bless you and all of us, too. Lots and lots of love always. Lorette. And now I'd introduce Roxanne to talk about her mom. So this is a bit of a different perspective. Um, maybe it's life, living life with one of these giants that went before us, these honorary life members. So I would like to begin with a quote that my mother wrote. I had no idea when I joined the Catholic Women's League in, of Canada in 1950 how much my life would be changed through active membership in the organization. Over the years, I would learn innumerable useful skills and develop traits that would serve me well. Persistence was perhaps the most important trait of all. How lucky for me and my siblings that mom wrote down much of her life journey for us to have. In 1950, she was lonely and looking for friends, and so encouraged by a League member, she joined the Catholic Women's League of Canada. She related that life was never the same after that, and that within months, she was serving at the Valentine Tea and acting as secretary at League meetings. Sounds familiar, right? She loved it, and over the years, her volunteer work in the parishes where she resided provided abundant opportunities for her to to hone her organizational and leadership skills. If mom wasn't driving us to various activities after supper, she was probably on the kitchen phone for hours, and I mean hours, organizing CWL business or off to a meeting in her tiny, ratty old Simca. We missed mom when she was out, but mostly because we got saddled with taking the phone calls. Mom often wrote messy notes on the backs of envelopes or bills and left them on the counter near the phone, which was considered to be her personal informal office. <laughs> Mom always encouraged me to join the League, but as a young mother, I was too busy and thought that it was only for old women. And now I'm one of those old women. <laughs> It wasn't until I moved to Vancouver in 2001 that I was personally invited to join through a parishioner, Sharon Sieben. I took up the challenge and have never looked back. Mom and I spent hours on the telephone talking about the league. She walked with me on my journey. She was patient in teaching me all about the league. She talked me down from the ledge a few times. <laughs> she encouraged me when I became discouraged and was always proud of my accomplishments. We attended five national conventions together, and the League was everything to my mom. And here's what she taught me about mentorship. Try to set a good example, listen to and encourage others, provide constructive feedback, use the talents that God gave you, always look for the truth, and be honest, knowledgeable, enthusiastic and respectful. In Edmonton, right up to her death, she shared a special bond with five League Life members. They gathered every few, every few months to share a meal and discuss League matters. I call them the Fabulous Five, and they were so important to Mom and her life in the League. I'm not sure who mentored whom. I think that they all learned from each other, and it only proves that we can all be mentors, especially to each other. Mom mentioned so many League women who were mentors in her life journey, women that encouraged, nurtured, and changed her. I would like to end with another quote from Mom's writings. The League is about community and hospitality, 
Participate and you will change. I did. Thank you. And just before we wrap up, I invite Claire Heron to say a few words. Sometimes, sometimes people approach you and say, would you like to say something? So this is when I began my preparation. I love the theme, the art of accompaniment, and it makes me think of uh, the three generations, or the two generations that went on before me. I'm a third generation league member, and I think I just figured out this is my 37th national convention. <laughs> And some of the first ones were with my mother, and I had always her support and the support of, of my spouse, because early meetings or early on in life with young children, you need that kind of support if you're going to get to a convention. So important to get to a convention and get to see the scope of the organization. But I, what I want to say for uh, finally, or almost finally, is it all began with a cake. I was a young mother, new to the city of Weyburn, Saskatchewan. My husband was the, rec was the Parks and Recreation Director for the community. And a lady came to the apartment with a cake. Not sure what kind of cake, but it was with a cake. And there was that generosity and that sense of hospitality that had to work on me for a while because I didn't become a member right away. But I felt that sense of welcome and we'd like you to be a part of us and I, I'll never forget that. The Catholic Women's League has given us all so many friendships and we've accompanied each other through thick and thin. Many of my friends through the League are now among the communion of saints. I want to say how I've observed Marilyn Olson who is a member of the military ordinary from Ottawa, how she has accompanied my good friend Joan Chester who had a stroke, as you know. Before there was any kind of formal help for Joan, Marilyn was there day after day after day, almost developing a program to help Joan. And to me, that is really the art of accompaniment and I want to commend and thank Marilyn for that. Joan has gone for a nap, so she's not hearing what I'm saying, but um, I, I just think it's so important that we acknowledge that. The Catholic Women's League gives us all adult education. We learn about our faith through the journey through the Catholic Women's League. Think about all of the issues that we've studied and uh, workshopped or had resolutions about. That's another form of accompaniment, I would say. And finally, I want to say, because of my 10 years with the Women's Interchurch Council of Canada, I really grew to understand how important ecumenism is in our journey, and uh, how those women have taught me so much. And, and also, I think I taught them some, because lots of times we would share about, well, that's why the Catholics do this, or why we don't do that. And uh, that, that group of people have taught me so much. And I live in a community that is totally ecumenical. Catholics are a minority. So it's so important, I think, for us to realize how we share our faith with one another. And I thank Velma for the words that she said about Wukpo because I had the wonderful opportunity of being with women from around the world for 10 years representing you. And, um, that journey with those women who come from such variety of lifestyles uh, just fills us with life and wonder and gratitude. Thank you, Claire. <clears throat> wow. So in the League, we have our faith, our sisterhood, and our love for the work we do for God in Canada. We have a great foundation. With the Holy Spirit to guide us, we will find the words we need when we need them. Synodality demands an openness, sets a place of trust and safety, no place for rebuttal or antagonizing. Let us leave room for the Holy Spirit to work. As Mary flew to Elizabeth, 
we too should fly to those who need us. Mary is our model. In Joy of the Gospel, we see Mary was able to turn a stable into a home for Jesus with poor swaddling clothes and an abundance of love. She is the handmaid of the Father who sings his praises. She is the friend who is ever concerned that why not be lacking in our lives. She is the woman whose heart was pierced by a sword and who understands all our pain. As a mother of all, she is a sign of hope for people suffering with the pangs of injustice. She is the missionary who draws near to us and accompanies us throughout our lives, opening our hearts by faith with her maternal love. As a true mother, she walks at our side. She shares our struggles, and she constantly surrounds us with God's love. This was taken from the joy of the gospel, and it follows beautifully on Archbishop Curry's homily from yesterday, which reminded us of Mary being really there for us, and we there for her. So a few words to close from our theme prayer. Lord Jesus, deepen the spiritual life of the Catholic Women's League. Strengthen the faith and good works of our members, building up life in the world by being Catholic and living it. May we imitate you with works of mercy, welcoming the forgotten, suffering or vulnerable wherever we encounter. Holy Spirit, strengthen us to live our faith, witnessing to life, peace, social justice, daily, wherever we are in Canada. You are awesome. I love you. Thank you so much. Well, I get the pleasure of, of thanking Barb and as apparently I'm an honorary life member too now, uh, <laughs> that uh, I get to say a few words. And I did have a few words that I, I sent to Barb earlier, but as I was listening to the stories that have come up and I was making my notes of what I was going to say to Barb, I said, you know, I need to tell you folks that I maybe haven't thanked you for accompanying me back when my husband died in 2003. Um, I was on the resolutions committee at the time. I have no idea how the word got around, but uh, I was to attend a meeting, uh, the resolutions meeting in Winnipeg on, I think, the 21st of June. I don't know why that date stands with me. And on the 16th of June, my husband died suddenly. So um, I think maybe the day after that, Bishop Crosby, who was the national spiritual advisor, and who had just been to New Brunswick in 2000, so I had met him. I get this phone call from him, and I'm thinking, how did you know about this? And that's all I wanted to know. But the machine, the, the CWL machine, obviously went into, went into uh, motion. Kim Scammell somehow, Becky Kalal took my place at the resolutions meeting. Uh, Bishop Crosby called me twice during, during a very bad period. And it just happened to be 10 days before my first child was being married. So it was a really, really strange time. However, my kids, I have four, and they all, every single one of them who, you know, practice their faith when they practice their faith, but every one of them noticed the input of the CWL. You couldn't get in the church, you couldn't get in the basement because of CWL members from New Brunswick and my local parish and my diocese who had attended the funeral. My, all my kids commented and my siblings as well. Besides that, my mailbox was full every day for a month at least. They'd pick up the, they'd pick up the mail and they'd say, here's another pile of cards. And I, would, I couldn't sleep, so in the night I would wake up and I said, I can't read those now. So in the middle of the night I would open 10 or 15 cards. So all, oh, all. Oh. Dioceses, I'm sure every single diocese in this country who had a CWL member or a CWL council sent me a card. And I was just so moved to it. So I I'm, I'm just want to say thank you to all of you for being that support and for accompanying me at that time. And that is something that has kept me going, I think, as a CWL member all, all these years. Not that I ever expected to be an honorary life member. That was probably the last thing on my mind. But I was, as I was hearing the stories of the honorary life members, all I could think of was, you know, it's about our story. 
And the people here who haven't heard the stories of, of um, uh, Jean Mahoney and Ardis Beaudry and Claire Heron and Marie, and you know, haven't heard those stories, this is part of your education and you'll take this home with you. And Barb has brought that with us today. So for that, I am truly thankful. And I, I've said, I'm not gonna write any more notes because I know you folks wanna go, but Barb, I know you know how much we appreciate what you've done for us. And uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful couple of hours. Thank you so much. Well, that was very good. You know, I, and, and I listen to those things, and it reminds me of when people say to me, why would I want to be part of the CWL? And you heard all my ranting about that yesterday. But you know, somewhere, sometime in our lives, we are going to need that kind of support. If we haven't experienced it yet, wonderful. And hopefully you never will, but you will, you will. There will be one time in your life that you are going to need that kind of support. So this is the formal end of our morning session.